Right from the beginning, Christchurch was intended to be a cathedral city. For the 19th century, Canterbury pilgrims were such men as knew they could not live by bread alone. From a stone laid in 1864, the cathedral grew to be centre of a modern provincial capital, memorial to founders whose plan of colonisation gave great and peaceful victory. One who can tell of the building's history is Canon Orange. When we show visitors around the cathedral, we usually begin in the western porch, because in the inscriptions on the wall, you get the details of the history which led up to the founding of the province and also ultimately to the building of the cathedral. At the western entrance are carved oak doors in memory of the wife of the third bishop. Such gifts from citizens are numerous. The nave is small by English standards, but impressive. Captain Owen Stanley RN on duty in Akaroa in 1840 has a memorial font. On the north wall are stone tablets, names famous in Canterbury. Dean Martin Sullivan shows these to some young friends and expounds details of the Selwyn Memorial pulpit. Now this first panel will interest you. Your Ruahi Rangi Tonga. Yes. Well now there's Bishop Selwyn preaching to the Maori people. And you never know. One of them might be an ancestor of yours in that group. Yes. Now over here, Paul Harper. Here's Bishop Harper, your great-great-grandfather and the first Bishop of Christchurch, arriving at Littleton with his wife and family and being welcomed by Bishop Selwyn. That was a hundred years ago this coming Christmas. So that's a very important moment and one that will especially interest you. The chapel of St Michael and St George commemorates the fallen of the whole British Commonwealth in two world wars. One hundred years after the arrival of the first of his predecessors, the present Bishop of Christchurch is the Right Reverend A.K. Warren. In a few weeks, Christchurch will be celebrating the centenary of the arrival of its first Bishop, Henry John Chitty Harper. It was his vision which conceived this cathedral and inspired our forefathers thus to mark the heart of the city with the sign of the cross. They thought that nothing was too good to go into this shrine which they built to the glory of God. Ever since its opening 75 years ago, this cathedral has striven to honor Bishop Harper's wish, to quote his own words, that it should be open to all worshippers without distinction on national occasions, on civic occasions, on sorrowful occasions, on joyful occasions. It has welcomed the citizens of Christchurch to worship. November was a good month for get-togethers. At Rotorua, representatives of junior chambers of commerce from all over the world looked into Waka Village to receive the traditional Maori welcome and get shown around. They were here for the 11th World Congress of their international organization. 200 delegates came from 29 countries, as far apart in geography and culture as Brazil and Thailand, Vietnam and Germany, Japan and France. Representing 400,000 members, the Junior Chamber International is dedicated to fostering better understanding among the young men of the world. New Zealanders, by acting host of them in this troubled year, are helping to encourage the climate of friendly cooperation from which a more settled world may emerge. At Massey College, 300 scientists from 38 countries gather for the 7th International Grasslands Congress. Veers of Australia meets Takahashi of Hawaii. Grossman of Brazil, Elsikoff and Evenstoff of the USSR with Calder New Zealand and Merton Love USA. (laughs) 
Russell, Australia, and Zwarth, Dutch, New Guinea. Delegates from Nepal, Sweden, and Finland meet in Clover and are joined by New Zealand expert and Congress President Sir Bruce Levy. This pooling of international research will enable us to make the land yield more food for a rapidly multiplying world population. Sir Bruce speaks of improving hill pastures. And our problem now, actually, is to reintroduce the, the uh, better species uh, into those turfs, uh, particularly accompanying the uh, um, aerial top dressing, Lovely story, which is becoming uh, general. Um, uh, throughout so the hill country. Is this plant indigenous in uh, New Zealand? Which no, plant is that? No. <laughs> At Milsom Aerodrome, Palmerston North, the Minister of Civil Aviation, the Honourable T.P. Shand, opens the world's first international agricultural aviation show. 40,000 people crowd the drone to see the latest developments in replacing the farmer's pack horse. Over 100 top dressing planes assemble for this unique display. New planes specially designed for the job and the old Tiger Moth, the first commercial duster in the country. Spelling out AIA for Aviation Industry Association, these aerial cowboys give a pretty demonstration of disciplined formation flying. Eyes and cameras turn earthwards a while as Group Captain Douglas Bader arrives on the tarmac with the Chief of Air Staff, Air Vice Marshal Kay. His interest in flying as keen as ever, this legendary hero is hemmed in as he goes to mount the steps to the control tower to see RNZAF vampires in tight formation aerobatics. The Yanks are here too, at zero feet in a heavyweight Globemaster. Clown of the show keeps the crowd amused and amazed at its almost ridiculous antics. Christchurch Parachute Club members do a static line stick jump. Second from the right's a girl, or is it? One of them is anyhow. Supply droppers give a nice display of precision delivery. More accurate than some paper boys we know. About 1,500 overseas visitors, amongst them delegates from the Colombo Plan and Grasslands Conferences, swell the number at a hill country farm to see New Zealand's newest industry in action. Only seven years ago, New Zealand carried out the first experiments in aerial top dressing and has gained world leadership in combining aviation and agriculture. Since 1949, more than a million tonnes of fertiliser have been spread on six million hilly acres and over 300 aircraft are regularly engaged in building the country's prosperity. Loading equipment too has been designed to meet the need for speed. A three-minute turnaround is the standard aimed at. From the increased carrying capacity of the land due to top dressing has grown the need for subdivision and fencing. Here again, the aerial agriculturalists have given it a go. Planes have been modified to take bomb loads of fencing materials. Coming in low over the selected spur, posts are accurately grouped. All they need now is portable post holes. In this type of country, one of these flying pack horses can do the work of 200 men, if you could find 200 men. Apart from thrilling the crowds, the helicopter shows just how useful it can be to the farmer. Able to fly and hover lower and slower than ordinary planes, the copter is more suitable for spraying noxious weeds. Air spraying thistles, for instance, costs just one-fifth of a ground spraying job.
the crowd inspects the dropping zone. As leaders in agricultural air power, New Zealand flyers through research and ingenuity are giving the land that increased productivity which the world so greatly needs.